Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to our first webinar of 2017 on a topic that is never far from people's minds these days in Brexit, and more specifically, what exporters need to know about it in 2017. My name is William Barnes-Graham, and I am the Digital Content Manager at Movement Export. We are a government-supported online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, RC Experts Forum, and our Export Action Plan tool. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of today's session, and you can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. We will also be reposting relevant questions onto our forum afterwards, so hopefully in one way or another you'll get useful answers to them. Please do note that Open to Export and both the speakers' organisations today are politically neutral and independent, so we will be trying to keep to the topic of the potential implications of Brexit on exporting as we know them at the moment, rather than touching on some of the more discussed uh, global national political ramifications of it. We are also recording the webinar today and uploading it to our YouTube channel, as well as linking to it on our website on the webinars page, where you can find out more about our upcoming webinars and listen to previous recordings too. We have two great speakers today. Um, they do note that uh, their presentations were largely prepared before today's speech, so um, give some leeway in that respect, if you could. Uh, to start off with, giving an overview of some of the potential outcomes of Brexit on the export landscape will be Mike Josipenko, a seasoned presenter on our webinars and the Special Director of Special Projects at the Institute of Export and International Trade and then giving tips for both planning for the short term and also the potential long term repercussions of the negotiations will be Mathilde Murphy, the Trade and Information Team Manager at Enterprise Europe Network. So without further ado, over to you, Mike. Good afternoon, Will. Good afternoon, everybody. So. Um, as we'll mention, the uh, slides that we're going to look at were presented before Mrs. May's speech, and it was very kind of her to act as a warmer back for our webinar this afternoon. Uh, so we're looking at how the unrolling of the Brexit process may uh, affect UK companies, both in the short term and, more importantly, the medium and long term. So uh, thank you, Will. Okay, so the exit process. Process. This has been pretty well covered in the press over the last few months. The, the notorious Article 15 of the Treaty of Lisbon is the, the starting point uh, for the, 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 the exit process and for the negotiation process. There is there's still some speculation, obviously, within the UK as to whether this process will be affected by a uh, decision by the UK courts. Uh, that's out of, the, out of our area of remit, unfortunately. But assuming that doesn't change matters, the intention is that the Article 50 will be triggered by the 31st of March, which will bring in a period of negotiations for the exit uh, procedure, uh, which are scheduled, according to Article 50, to last up to two years. Um, once two years have passed, there is the option for negotiations to be extended, uh, but any uh, subsequent extension to negotiations must be agreed by all of the partner organizations within the existing EU member states. So um, there is large potential for any one country to, to steamroll the, any extension to the negotiation process. And the, the onus is on trying to negotiate a settlement within two years that's acceptable to all parties. What that does mean is, at least in respect of the, the regulatory framework of the environment that we have to work with, there is not likely to be any great short-term change. The regulations are uh, as they are. We remain a member of the European Union. We will continue to remain a member of the European Union with all the benefits, obligations, and costs that that brings until the negotiations are complete and the exit takes place. Um, so businesses still have a period of two years to work with. Obviously, there are wider uncertainties, and some of those will be looked at by our, our next speaker, maybe. Uh, so in the short term, no immediate change. What the landscape will look like after the uh, exit agreement 
will really depend on how the negotiations go. And Prime Minister gave some indications to anybody that was listening to her speech earlier today as to what the UK's starting point is going to be. So she made the point, first of all, that um, they don't intend to use any model that's currently enjoyed by other countries, which rules out some standard options. Uh, she also made it fairly clear that we do not seek membership of the single market, but access to some other components of the single market. Uh, likewise, they don't want to be bound by the customs union that takes place within the European Union at the moment, uh, but to want to have some elements of it to, to, to our advantage. It's important to bear in mind that the whatever agreement is negotiated, that agreement must be approved by the member states, and it must be approved by what's known as the qualified majority. So that's that, what is a qualified majority? Well, effectively, that is uh, 20 minimum of the remaining member states, but those 20 member states that vote in favour must represent 65% of the population of the European Union. So it goes from that that uh, any agreement must uh, have the favour and the agreement of the major countries, which are the players within the European Union. And as I said, it can be extended after the two-year period, but any single member can, can terminate that process. And if there is no agreement uh, finalised after the two-year process, we leave the European Union as we joined it. So we become uh, an independent trading country, as uh, in the same way that the USA, China, Japan are members, independent trading countries, and we would trade with the EU on those terms. So in terms of what sort of exit we get, it could range anything from what's been called the soft Brexit, which would incorporate various aspects of um, the single market or the customs union without being formally membership of, uh, members of those. The sort of things that would be included in there would be the potential for goods to be sold within the union uh, without import duties being imposed on the point of importation, uh, with minimal documentary requirements, with no barriers to trade, um, and also with freedom to sell services or to deliver services. And it's important to bear in mind that uh, services are an important component in EU trade. They make up just under 50% of the UK's exports at the, at the moment. So the service sector is very, very significant. So assuming we get a soft exit, it would be looking for some sort of settlement that has some aspects of the single market, some aspects of the customs union. One thing that's almost certain to happen is that there will be some custom, some form of customs clearance process when goods are sold or bought to or from the European Union. Um, the, the, it was never something to be ruled out, but none of the existing relationships that the EU has with any external country does allow that goods should be transferred without any customs clearance process. Looking at the other end of the scale, the, the, the harder end of the, of the agreement, if we leave without any uh, settlement, as I said, we simply trade with the EU in the same way that the US or China trades with the European Union. Goods can be sold into there, but goods have to uh, comply with product quality regulations, we have to uh, collaborate with trade policy, meet the requirements, goods will be subject to import duties, uh, potentially you'll have to provide documentation such as invoices, potentially certificates of origin to prove what the origin of the goods are. Um, and that would apply in both directions, whether we're selling goods to the European Union or whether we're buying goods from the European Union. So a whole range of outcomes and one of the common themes you'll see in this presentation is that we simply don't know exactly how that landscape is going to look. We're just looking at the possibilities. Thank you, Will. Some of the, 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 the likely outcomes, though, we will, as the Prime Minister mentioned, need to write new legislation. And the indication was already there that there will be legislation in place on the day that we leave the European Union, and the suggestion was that the, 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 the legislation on that day will probably be not diff too different from the, the legislation that we currently enjoy. Obviously, the current legislation is based on EU legislation, so the, in the short term we'll simply rubber stamp it as UK legislation, but that then gives us the freedom to change laws as we please, whether that's for employment, whether that's around customs, or any other aspects of, of, of life. Um, so there will be, in the longer term at least, if not on day one, the opportunity to change customs regulations, which could be 
a positive benefit for exporter, uh, exporters. Uh, many people will be aware that the EU brought in a new customs set of regulations in uh, 2016, known as the Union Customs Code. And while many companies didn't see much difference from those, other companies were found them quite strenuous and quite inconvenient. So there's been some correspondence and conversation that some of the late regulations may change, and that could simplify matters for UK traders. As I mentioned a moment ago, UK to EU trade could be the same as third country, third country being custom speak for trading with a country outside the European Union. So there will almost certainly be some form of customs clearance process when the goods leave the UK and arrive at their destination or vice versa. What will that look like? That's anybody's guess. Um, those of you who were trading um, 25, 30 years ago may remember the days of goods arriving at Dover um, on a truck and having to clear goods at Dover before they can move onwards. Uh, that would be very difficult to replicate in this day and age, not least because there aren't huge numbers of customs officers and there's not an awful lot of space and facilities available. So it's desirable that any customs process that's needed should be as uh, straightforward as possible and we are in a world of electronic customs declarations but customs clearance in its current form um, is a barrier it's a point at which goods are physically stopped and examined potentially and it's a point at which customs duties and taxes are charged so there's nothing to stop uh, the government from setting up a softer arrangement for customs clearance. After all, we've traded with the EU for almost 30 years without requiring any customs clearance uh, with goods without being stopped or, or inspected. So there's no reason why that shouldn't change. So there is the potential to set up a customs clearance process that's relatively light touch that could be administered perhaps as an administrative process similar to the VAT regulations, but it would require quite a substantial change in shift from the UK government. Whichever way it works, it's important that that system is workable, not only for ourselves, but for uh, the EU as well. And it also has to take into account, of course, the land border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. Um, and the two implications there being that the freedom of movement of individuals to travel across the border, but equally it will be a border for goods between the UK, between the UK and the rest of the European Union. So any arrangement that's settled that must bear in mind that that border is, 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 is a slightly unusual circumstance. We will almost certainly have to have some documentation. Um, at the very least, commercial invoice will be required to go through any customs clearance process. Uh, there may be a need for other documentation, such as certificates of origin, to prove whether the goods are our UK or EU origin, or whether they've been simply imported from China and resold. Uh, there may be a need to provide certificates of conformity, because at the moment, goods sold from the UK to the EU, uh, if they're in free circulation, it's taken as understood that they conform to all the technical standards. Once we leave the EU, we can't guarantee that. So there may be a need to provide documents which prove that they conform to any standards that prevail. And as I mentioned, there may be a requirement for import duties uh, to be charged either when we import goods from the European Union or to be charged by the EU countries when we export them to the European Union. Um, the level of import duties will depend on the outcome of the negotiations. In an ideal world, we'll be able to provide some formula where the, the duties will be negated through some form of free trade agreement. That may be conditional on the origin of the goods, which may then start to factor as to how people do their business. So that could potentially prejudice a trader that imports goods from China and simply re-exports re or re-delivers the goods across Europe. Uh, but there may be a need to demonstrate what the origin of the goods is. If you're thinking about the potential damage that import duties could do to your goods when you're selling them, you only have to look at the, the current UK or EU customs tariff and see what the customs duty would be if those similar goods were imported from the USA. And that will give you a good snapshot into the worst case scenario for your goods if we leave the EU without any, without any uh, positive benefit. That, that's the rate that would potentially apply to your goods. There will be implications for companies selling services, um, whether they are financial services or, or others, such as architecture. At the moment, any UK business as a member of the EU has the right to set up or deliver services anywhere across the, the, the single market area. It also has the right 
um, to establish a business in any any place in that single market area. So these rights will need to be negotiated as part of the settlement. And of course, the the financial services is a particularly hot potato because it does. Uh, relate to quite a large percentage of the UK's balance of trade. So that will be significant and uh, that is something that will automatically disappear if we leave the single market entirely. So that will be need to be negotiated over. Of course, companies, if they wish to sell to the EU, even if EU technical standards aren't part of UK law, companies will still need to conform to those standards if they want to sell their products across the EU. And in the short term, that's not a problem because most UK companies will be conforming to those standards automatically in their day-to-day -day business. But as we change any standards and regulations in the years ahead, that could potentially lead to a divergence in the longer term where companies might have to either change the standards they apply to their goods to conform to EU standards for sale in that most markets, or at the very least, provide evidence that they do conform to those standards in the form of certification. Thanks, Will. As I mentioned earlier, the Prime Minister has ruled out any off-the-peg solutions, any models currently enjoyed by the other countries, but it's worth looking at some of the, some of the relationships with other countries have the EU to give us some clues as to how an outcome might look if we start defining what bits uh, work best for us. Um, the, the best one in terms of access to the single market is the Norway option. They have very widespread access into the single market, including financial services, but that, is, that option is very unlikely, simply because that by accepting the single market, they have to accept freedom of movement of people. So I think that's not a runner. Perhaps more, more appropriate is perhaps the Turkey option. The Turkey option includes, Turkey has a customs, uh, uh, sorry, a customs union with the European Union. This customs union is slightly different from the one which rules within the European member states in as much as there is still customs clearance when goods are moved from the UK to Turkey or the EU to Turkey and vice versa. But it does mean that any goods which are in free, a wide range of goods which are in free circulation in the EU can be sold in Turkey without import duties um, and vice versa. So that does at least cover the issue of import duties in, in both ends of the, the scale. At the other end of the scale, the hard, hard Brexit, the World Trade Organization option. We are a member of the World Trade Organization and we will continue to be a member of the World Trade Organization when we leave. There are some formalities we need to go to, such as setting up our tariffs uh, schedules with the World Trade Organization, but that membership will allow us to trade with the, e with the EU in the same way that every other country does. It will be subject to import duties, it will be subject to customs clearance, it will be subject to having to meet the technical standards, but it does provide us with a minimum uh, going level. World Trade Organization membership also does allow us to at least negotiate free trade agreements, either with the EU or with other countries. So there is a, it's not a complete wilderness. World Trade Organization benefit does, membership does give us some benefits. Thanks, Will. So, so far we've been talking primarily about trading with EU countries, which many people do as a, a large part of their international business, but it's not all about trading with the EU. We still have to consider trading with the other uh, nearly 200 countries that make up the world community. And there's nothing to stop us doing business with oh, these countries in the future, in the same way there's not been anything stopping us doing business with these countries in the, in the past. Um, so it's, in, it's hoped that countries will trade more widely outside the European Union will set their sights further afield. One of the issues that has to be considered, though, is if we're selling with, to countries that, uh, with which the EU has a free trade agreement, once we leave, we won't be able to take part in that free trade agreement. So if you're selling to a country such as South Africa, and we have a free trade agreement and your goods are of EU origin, um, once we leave, they won't be able to take advantage of the preferential duty rates that come with that free trade agreement. Um, now, in many businesses, that may not be significant. Their import duties in South Africa may be only a few percent, and you may get your business not because your prices are cheaper than the competitors, but because your products are better, the services you deliver are better, because people want to buy UK products. But it is a factor for some businesses, so it's something to, to bear in mind. 
Of course, the positive side of this is that once we leave, the UK will be able to negotiate our own free trade agreements, whether it's with the EU or with other countries. Um, we have to be, bear in mind that we can't begin that formal negotiation process until we do leave, because uh, an, EU, an EU member cannot negotiate separate agreements, so we have to wait until we formally leave before we can start the formal process. Um, but there are discussions, as you'll have seen in the press, already in place. Um, some discussion about how long free trade agreements would take. They, don't, they do tend to take a long time, simply because they are agreements under international law. So even once you've done the haggling and the bargaining for the benefits, they have to go through the, the legal process before they're even implemented into law. So it's not something that's going to happen overnight. But there's a strong argument that says any negotiations that we have as one country with a partner country, whether that's Australia, China, USA, uh, the negotiating process will doubtlessly be less complex because it hasn't got to take into account the trade policies and the political opinions of 28 countries. So I think that does give us a, a window of opportunity there. Thanks, Will. So I think the message that I would take away from this is that the, the, the EU uh, the short term, no change. Long term, we need to see what the outcome is going to be. But of course, there's a whole world out there. So I think this should be the driver, as the Prime Minister said, for increased trade outside the EU. Some of those markets may be fairly complex markets, as you'll have seen in perhaps at previous webinars. But complex markets are quite often the ones where the rewards are highest. So businesses that aren't trading in those markets now strongly should consider uh, looking at those markets and seeing how how they can serve, how they can enter into those markets so it's a, it's incumbent on businesses to explore as many new opportunities as possible in the same way that it's incumbent on the government to negotiate for new free trade agreements as soon as it's able to do so with strategic partners um, and some of the examples there on the slide the USA Australia India China of all countries been countries that have been mentioned. Brazil was another country that's been mentioned today. So lots and lots of opportunities. And I think um, although the next couple of years are going to be interesting times, they're going to bring some uncertainty, I think there is a, a lot of opportunity out there in the wider market. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, my section of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, over to Will and over to Matilde. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, really great. Um overview there and so it's obviously it's, it's not the easiest thing to talk about today given uh, the new announcements so well done for for covering all the new new developments while um kind of giving the, the broad overview of everything that might happen we're going to do a couple of polls quickly um so it's just to gauge kind of some of the feelings around uh brexit and exporting the first of these is about how confident you feel um in terms of doing trade with the eu after Brexit. So um, I'll just leave that for a few seconds and um, see see what results we get there. Um, already looking quite interesting. So I'll give that another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'll share that. So most people understand to be feeling quite quite neutral about it, but a lot some confidence there, and um, also some people not feeling as confident. So it's it's, it's an interesting poll that, um, and I'm sure that will, will will change as things go on. And the second poll is going to be as I get round to it. Oh, apologies, haven't done two polls before. Second poll is. Do you intend to expand your horizons to trade with new non-EU uh, countries? And again, I'll just give that a few more seconds. And unsurprisingly, yes, quite a lot of people <laughs> are intending to do so. So. Um, it's definitely an exciting time for global Britain, as Theresa May has called it today. Um, so thank you to everyone for answering those polls. And I'd now like to hand over to Mathilde for the second part of the presentation. Hello, Will. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. So we are now going to look at the, take a closer look at the practical steps and the points that businesses can look at uh, 
uh, when uh, thinking about Brexit. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so um, my first point would be really, um, and as discussed before, is that because we don't know a lot about what's going to happen, uh, let's keep calm and carry on. Uh, in fact, recent economic figures and announcements have not shown any major shocks. Um, and my advice as well would be, uh, and it would be for any business that aims to be innovative and looking uh, forward, to be flexible and adapt adaptive to the world that is uh, that they're facing. The only constant in this world is change, as my uh, one of my previous directors used to say. Um, so, um, uh, to go into more practical uh, aspects of it, uh, here are a few points that I would like to mention. Um, it would be worth uh, for businesses to review their internal processes. So, uh, for example, um, if uh, in, in terms of accountancy software, if you have an online sales uh, business, if you do any sales online, um, does your accountancy software uh, have capacity for changes in VAT rates that you charge to your customers when they are abroad? If you're selling just to the EU, you wouldn't have necessarily to think about that because you can zero rate all the invoices. If uh, with Brexit, this could change and uh, the rates of VAT would change in every country, so you'd have to look at that potentially. Um, also, uh, work on your internal policies. Um, by this, I mean environmental policies, your processes internally, the certifications you work towards or you are accredited to, at, uh, particularly if they're international ones, because they will help prove your credentials uh, going forward and your EU customers in particular will still need to see, uh, as Mike mentioned before, uh, EU approved standards that you, you comply with uh, in order to sell your goods on the uh, EU territory. So, for example, C marking was mentioned. Um, it's also worth looking at um, the pool of skills you have in your business and think about that when you're recruiting. Um, for example, you might want to search for people with skills especially related to international trade practical uh, international trade documentation practical day-to-day uh, -day aspects of exporting uh, but also um, uh, for your HR department or anybody who looks after um, uh, employment in your company if you deliver services uh, in the EU countries at the moment such as construction services uh, or exhibitions, um, if you post workers abroad for a short period of time, at the moment the legislation around this is covered by, uh, by the EU and it's fairly streamlined, although you have, still have to look at national uh, registrations, etc., but it's harmonized across the EU. Once uh, Brexit has happened, uh, this could uh, change. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, looking at having highly skilled uh, employment specialists in, in your business. Um, in general though, uh, planning for an increased capacity for paperwork and administrative tasks uh, is really worthwhile uh, in view of what could happen. Um, and therefore considering training sessions on export documentations, on customs, uh, inco terms, which are all export uh, jargon that you might be familiar with, would be really uh, important. Also, um, look at your supply chain. Um, you might have a heavy cost base uh, buying a lot in euros or in other currencies at the moment. Suppliers from uh, Europe or, or, or uh, international suppliers. Uh, you should look at um, closer to home. Uh, consider UK suppliers for either total uh, diversification, not putting all your eggs in the same basket, or for a complete change um, so that you, you don't uh, rely too much on these high costs from, from the EU with, with the weak pound that we've seen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, further on, um, again, um, 
safeguarding tips, but also carrying on with, with the same theme. Um, it's worth um, looking at, keeping an eye on contributing to consultations from the EU or the UK, which could change to legislation. We, we've, we've mentioned earlier that uh, legislation will have to change. Um, there are ways to get your voice heard about, uh, about um, changes in legislation at EU level and also at UK level. Uh, so uh, this um, slide shows a hyperlink to um, a website where you can look for current European consultations where businesses are asked to, to, to provide feedback. At the moment, as we are in the EU, you can have your say. Once you, we are uh, out, um, this will be more difficult or you could have a say but you can't have any impact or, um, on, on the you won't be in control of the consequences and you won't be involved in making the rules. So uh, this is uh, quite important as well. Um, going again on the uh, le legal aspects, uh, what about your legal department, your solicitor, if you don't have a legal department in, in your small business? Are they geared up to help you with potential changes in drafting contracts, um, dra um, drafting contracts of employment for your uh, foreign staff, for example? or for the workers you post abroad for a certain period of time, or indeed for screening uh, applications uh, of future employees and their visa st status. Um, at the moment, we don't have that issue with EU applicants, but going um, after Brexit, this could certainly become the case, as we, we, um, Theresa May has hinted today. Uh, what about commercial contracts as well? Um, at the moment, if you have distributors' agreements, um, whether you draft them yourself or use a solicitor, uh, the dispositions in them are covered by an EU legislation. Um, again, this will change once uh, Brexit has happened. If you have EU workers in your company, uh, they might be worried about what's their status, but what's going to happen to them depending on how long they've been in the country. So you might want to consider supporting them and reassure, reassure them on their status in your company. Uh, maybe research uh, permanent resident status for, on their behalf and see if they, what, they, what their plans are, although it will be a personal decision. Uh, showing an interest will, will, will help with the, the morale in, in the company. Um, we've mentioned currency awareness uh, with the weak pound. Uh, how can you make the most of this at the moment? We know it's going to stay probably quite variable for, for a long time. Uh, currency hedging, having a euro account could be options that you sh could look into. Uh, and also considering opening a branch or an office in another European country because that office could become your EU single market window when trading with EU partners uh, if the UK is uh, completely out of the EU single market. Foreign investment agencies uh, are on a crowd to attract UK businesses at the moment, so whether you know, you're small or big, uh, and they want to uh, attract them to their country as uh, these next two slides, um, next two pictures shows on the next slide. Uh, these were two billboard campaigns that were quite uh, prominent in, in London and uh, uh, in the country uh, from France and Germany. Next slide, please. So what, um, I think we've got one before that, Will, please. Thank you. Uh, so what support is available um, to help you with, with all these points? Um, well, first of all, um, in terms of EU trade, the good news is that Enterprise Europe Network, which is an EU-funded project, is here to stay. Um, we have secured our funding for the next two years at least. And we also have 500 plus offices across the EU member states. So that means we can still access on your behalf uh, a wealth of information about our EU neighbour markets in terms of national legislation, market information, uh, and more importantly, finding you the right commercial or technology partner, uh, distributor, agent, joint venture partner, technology licensee, etc., etc. So on this slide, you have an example of the support we have offered uh, to our 
clients following their Brexit inquiries. And as you can see, it ranges from finding incentives to, to have a, to set up a, an office in another country, to find a payroll provider, um, or inquiring about VAT rates, uh, employment law, and of course the marking, which is on, ongoing in terms of the, the support we offer to businesses. Next slide, please. In the wider, uh, more global uh, aspects of things, uh, the Department for International Trade, uh, the Institute of Export, Open to Export, etc., to name a few, we'll, we'll also continue to support uh, businesses with their export strategy. So planning, choosing the right market, market research, and they don't focus only on Europe. So as Mark said, it's a big wide world uh, here uh, ahead of us. Uh, with lots of opportunities outside the EU, so it's worth exploring. For other aspects of the, the planning I mentioned in my previous slides, such as skills training, uh, it's worth contacting your local growth hub and chambers of commerce and also looking at webinars for open to export, etc., um, because they will cover the skills that your staff might need to um, to get more knowledgeable on certain aspects of, of exporting. And of course, don't forget your bank uh, or currency specialist for more specialist advice on getting paid or being a good payer to your foreign suppliers, for instance. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to mention um, support available in in terms of funding. Um, EU funding is still available to UK businesses. Um, in fact, Theresa May mentioned this morning in her speech that uh, she has, uh, she will honour, uh, the government will honour any uh, funding, any grants that have been committed before art Article 50 is triggered. So that means anything that, <coughs> that has been uh, committed so far, but also anything that will be uh, committed between now and uh, Brexit is, 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 uh, is uh, Article 50 is triggered. So um, there are um, there is still funding and there are still grants available to UK businesses. Whether you want to apply you, just as one uh, entity or with partners in the EU, and we, we strongly uh, encourage companies to explore that. They're not for everybody. They're not for every type of business, but if you are in a an innovative company, uh, it's likely that there is something for you somewhere. Um, also, we think that the um, general UK support in terms of grants funding but business support in general is going to ramp up uh, to address the, the productivity and innovation agenda of the government. Um, and uh, Innovate UK, but also the growth hubs um, are, have got funding available, again, depending on your sector and your, the, 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 the activities that you want to fund. But it's worth contacting them to, to find out uh, a bit more about that. Next slide. What are the um, aspects of trade with the euro that will re remain the same? We've mentioned a few already. Um, the euro is still here to say surprisingly uh, enough. There are 19 countries that use it. Um, yes, the, the, the currencies are fluctuating, but um, it's influenced by economic and political situations. But uh, at the moment, there are no uh, signs of any country exiting from the euro. So again, looking at... Uh, knowing your options in terms of currency is quite important. And um, another thing that uh, is not going to change is that you have EU counterparts, whether they're your clients or your suppliers. They also need to prepare and they also wonder what is going on. Um, so um, it's worth talking to them, engaging, working and planning together so that you are aligned and there's no, uh, there are no surprises on, on each other's sides. Next uh, slide, please. And uh, another point is about um, your intellectual property and protecting it. Um, we haven't heard too much about it, but it's been um, 
it's never been not it's, it's, so it's 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 been confirmed so i think we can still go ahead with that despite theresa may uh, speech today um, the uk will sign the um, unitary patent court agreement which is um, a new regime that is planned to come into force at the end of 2017 uh, whereby businesses will be able to protect and enforce their pay patent rights across Europe in a more streamlined way with a single patent and through a sig single patent court which would be higher than the uh, British uh, court. Uh, most of the signatories of this um, agreement are EU member states, but it's not an EU institution, uh, not an EU institution. Um, I see this as a sign that the EU wants to keep the protection of invention within the EU model. And I put here a quote from uh, Tony Rollins, the president of Chartered Institute of Patent Attorney, showing that it will be good news for particularly smaller businesses to, to protect um, and enforce their, their patent rights. And finally, next slide. Um, I think it's worth keeping in mind the reason why you are running your business. Um, you hopefully have quality, high quality and attractive goods and services with the British brand and uh, you are proud of what you are selling. And this has definitely got an attraction to your customers wherever they are coming from. So. It's, it's just keep at it and demand will stay. Of course, you still got to, to be innovative and to look at any trends, etc. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, the Brits are known for the, the quality of the products that they, and the innovation, innovative products that they, they, and services that they produce. So um, it's, um, it's, it's a good, valid and positive point to make to make at this point. Um, also, cultural awareness, um, that's not changing. Uh, the French will remain the French, the Italians will remain the Italians they are, and uh, the good relationship with you have with all your partners uh, reinforce the human factor of any trade um, activity that happens that will happen for many centuries uh, because at the end of the day people do business with people. So on that note I will finish my presentation and thank you very much. Uh, thank you Matilda um, and especially for the positive last point about um, how ultimately it's people on the other side of the channel and will still be the same people and um, yeah hopefully international business is all about those personal relationships. So. Um, there's nothing any negotiations, negotiations will do about that. We're now going to open the floor for questions. So please do ask questions using the control panel on the right-hand side. Remember that we will only be asking questions relevant to the topic of what you need to know about Brexit as exporters rather than some of the uh, political aspects of it. Um, so first question is one from Kendra. And Kendra's asked, um, how will we work with other countries' export organizations like BAFA going forward, by which um, Kendra means, I think, the Federal Office for Ec Economic Affairs and Export Control in Germany. Uh, Mike, do you want to have a, have a go at that? Yes, yes. Uh, that's an interesting one. Export controls are, to some extent, um, coordinated and common across the EU, but not always. Most of it is strategic export controls, by which we mean military goods and dual-use goods, are as a result of international conventions. So the EU implements legislation uh, across uh, dual-use goods commonly, which the UK accepts. We also have our own legislation, though, uh, over and above EU legislation, both in terms of military goods and some dual-use goods. So. Um, I think in, in, in the immediate sh uh, short term, we will replace the EU legislation with UK legislation so that we have a similar uh, export licensing regime. Um, so there shouldn't be too much difference in, in, in that respect in the, in the longer term. Um, at the moment, one of, one of the things that potentially happens is that many dual-use goods which are sold within Europe do not actually use 
sold, sorry, from the UK to Europe, uh, do not actually need an export license to be sold to the European Union, provided the goods are, goods are ultimately staying there. Um, once the European Union just becomes another third country for the UK, then in theory those goods may need a, an export license of some sort to be sold to European Union countries. Um, but I think that's, that's an issue that could potentially be solved by the UK government setting up some form of an open general license which would apply to EU transactions. So I think the, the situation in regard to export controls is more likely to be centered around the large international conventions than purely around EU law, so we will adapt to those larger conventions and, the, and the, the commitments that we have within the international community. Uh, thanks, Mike. And um, moving on to Lana's question, she's asked about, um, it's, it's touching on some of the points you made, Matilda, just why would a company want to establish an office in Europe? Um, can, you, can you expand on the uh, setting up in Europe as a way of maybe dealing with Brexit? Yes, so as I mentioned on my slides, um, if the UK is out of, um, uh, is, is, is implementing Brexit, uh, it's very likely that we will be out of the single market. So uh, thinking of uh, setting up a branch or an office in a country that is still in the EU single market and an EU member state could be a good move to help you carry on trading uh, with this, uh, with your current partners in, in Europe and reassure them about what, what you can do. Uh, so you have to research it. It's not, um, you know, sometimes it might, some countries are easier to set, it's easier to set up business, business in, in some countries than others. We can help you with that. We can research this information. Um, it's true that some countries are, as I said, um, trying to attract foreign investors at the moment, um, small or large. Um, there is a wealth of information available on, on various websites about what the incentives might be. Um, you could also benefit from EU funding in doing so. Uh, so it's worth looking at, at it and by any, any means if uh, you want to find out more, uh, get in touch um, directly and uh, I'll make, um, I'll make, uh, make you, uh, put you in touch with the, the right person to discuss it. Uh, thank you, Mathilde. And we've had a couple of questions coming in about VAT. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask one by Rachel, which is, will leaving the EU affect legislation slash VAT for online subscription-based services? Um, I don't know, Mathilde, do you want to hit that or, or Mike? Oh. Um, I'm happy to. Mike, do you want to answer that, Mathilde? I'm happy to. Well, I'll start. Um, VAT uh, in Europe is very complex. Uh, I know quite a bit, but it depends so much on the situation, on the type of service, on the location or the delivery of the service, etc. that it's difficult to make general comments. So I would invite uh, the, the, this uh, attendee to to get in touch directly and I, I can see if I can help or if somebody can help. Uh, I don't have all the answers, as I said, it, it can be quite complex. Uh, going forward, um, well, the VAT legislation will probably not, will not apply anymore, that's an EU legislation, so that is going to be a whole new world of, um, of, of, of regulation, which would be how the potentially, well, the EU as a block without the UK is going to go, and then carry on, uh, obviously, uh, using that legislation that they have. How do they react to us being out of it? Uh, I'm not sure if it makes it simpler or more complex at the moment. I, I would need to look into that. Uh, as Matilda said, it's largely, a, it will be dictated by the nature of the exit agreement. I mean, in one circumstance, it could simply be that the um, the VAT regulations for supplying any types of goods or services uh, to countries within the EU become the same as those which currently are supply, sorry, which currently apply if you're supplying those same goods and services to a country outside the EU, such as the USA. Uh, but it is too early to make any drastic statements on that. It will depend on exactly what that agreement entails, and that's, as, as we've already discussed, it's going to be a, a fairly lengthy and complex process. So I think, you know, my advice with all of these things is, uh, keep your eyes open, watch the negotiations, plan for the worst case scenario, but hope for the, hope for the best or something better. Cool, thanks both. Um, 
And the question from uh, Ewan, um, which is, if if tariffs do come in, and this might be another one where we can't say an exact answer yet, but if, if tariffs do come in, what level of cost do you think they will be? Or I guess, where, how do you be able to predict or find out uh, what sorts of costs might be involved going forward? I'm happy to cover that initially if you wish. Um, again, you, uh, I, I wasn't sure from that question whether he's looking at the point of view from an exporter's point of view, in other words, what import duties would apply to his goods when they're imported into the destination in the European Union. Uh, the easiest way to check that is to have a look at the uh, current EU tariff which applies, uh, which can be found on the Europa website or the EU market access database website. Um, you can look at the tariffs that apply uh, for importation into the European Union. Um, it may ask you to put the country of origin in there. If you, you can't put the UK at the moment because we're in the EU, but if you if you do an exercise with your product and you look at the tariff that applies for that product currently imported from the USA, that gives you the one option as to what that tariff rate might be. So that's the level of the cost that would apply to your goods, um, that would be added to your goods by it would be paid by an importer in the EU. Um, of course, there is the possibility that tariffs may not apply, so as part of some settlement we may get some sort of tariff relief. That tariff relief may not apply to all goods, it may only apply to goods which do originate in the UK or EU. So again, this is part of the process of planning for the future, look at what the tariffs would be, uh, look, perhaps have a look at the origin of your goods to see whether if there is any uh, origin agreement whether you would be affected or whether you'd be able to take advantage of any benefits that come from that. But the the, the, the EU tariff uh, at the U U U European uh, EU market access database will give you the, the rate of duty that would apply in those circumstances. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um... And we've, we've had a, a few questions kind of touching on a, on a point which you raised, Mathilde, which is about um, how to reassure kind of EU employees uh, that they have at the moment. And I know you just a little bit in the slide, in, that you, that you, in the slides that you presented, but um, in fact, quite a lot of questions about it in terms of what can we do to, to reassure kind of EU staff um, within, within the company or organization? Yeah, it's very tricky. Um, well, I'm personally in that situation uh, as well, um, being French. Um, I've been here 15, 16 years now, so um, um, there is uh, this um, residency um, um, status that uh, um, it, persons, in citizen, sorry, um, uh, persons can apply to. Uh, if they've been in the country for more than five years, but um, it, it, they shouldn't have to do it um, because if they've, they've been here more than five years, it, it's a, it's a recognised it's a recognised uh, right. Uh, but the trend apparently seems to be that uh, people are worried about about it and want to um, want. Sorry, I'm having lots of problems with my uh, web. Um, access, so just bear with me. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, people are worried and there seems to be a trend to want to apply for, for this uh, residency status. Um, it's difficult to know what businesses can do, but at least um, an awareness from employers I think is quite important and making sure that they monitor any signs of anxiety or worries and on a personal level, try and identify what the, st the staff is planning to do because it could have consequences on uh, whether they, they might leave or they even might have to leave, but also they might say, well, on a personal basis, what, what should I be doing? And it, it's true that, that they haven't got any answers because they can't give any legal advice because there is no legislation on the subject at the moment. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an open... Um, discussion to be had and I think uh, it's worth employers um, having that conversation with their employees and be aware of it and uh, and that some I've, I've read in, on some blogs that um, uh, employers might want to pay for the residency application which is 65 pounds um, and support the employee with the, with the application which is 85 pages long <laughs> but um, you know, 
um, every every circumstances, every personal circumstances, it will be individual. So it's difficult to give a general comment on that. Mm, well, yeah, thank you for um, for offering, offering what you could there. So it's definitely a difficult one. Um, and I think what will be our last question is. Um, Will exporters, this is from Liz, will exporters still have access to things like the MAD, uh, MADB or, or something similar in terms of checking uh, what their documentation needs will be um, in short term and long term? Oh, um, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, the MADB, I think she's referring to the market access database, which is that uh, database that Mike mentioned. There's another one called the Export Help Desk. One of the two, I can never remember which one is for which in terms of import or export from an EU perspective. But both these databases are public databases that are available on the EU website. Uh, they are quite technical and can be a bit difficult to, to navigate. Uh, but we're here, we can help with that. And uh, I don't expect them to go away. They are an EU product. Uh, what will be needed is uh, for the UK authorities to liaise with the EU authorities to update their their customs criteria or whatever the re regulatory criteria they're going to implement because that's uh, relying on each a communication between all the the authorities on 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 the on to, to update the information that is available on there. <coughs> Cool. Thank you, Mathilde. And uh, thank you, Mike, as well. We're going to finish the, the questions there, but um, a really, really uh, lively flurry of questions came in, came in at the end there. We've got all sorts which we will hopefully be able to address on the forum afterwards. So on that note, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up. And yeah, thank you once again, Mike and Mathilde, for what's some really useful tips and guidance for what will thank certainly you. be a, a interesting period. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we will be posting some of these questions onto our forum in the aftermath to this webinar. So please do keep your eyes peeled for these and let us know if you'd like to withdraw your questions from this process. Um, before heading off, just a couple of notes. Um, we're running another series of competitions this winter for UK SMEs looking for cash towards their export plans. We're going to be running a few different finals for competition for the competition this time, meaning there will be more opportunities for you to win some great prizes. So make sure you get your action plan submitted to us before February 10th. And as always, do get in touch if you have any questions about how to enter. And finally, our next webinars follow on pretty nicely from some of the points made today and also the outcome of that second poll. And it's about the potential importance of looking beyond the EU to new markets overseas. The first session of the Beyond the EU series will be on Russia on February 1st. And further field, you can register to sessions on both North and South America. And we also recently did a Commonwealth uh, webinar at the end of last year. And we've, we've done webinars on India and China as well. So you can catch all of those on our webinars page. That's all from us for now. Please do take our survey as you exit to let us know what you thought of the webinar and to give any suggestions for improvements or future topics. We hope you can make it to the next one, but for now, goodbye.